The history of distillation in Vermont is uh, an ironic twist. Uh, we in the present day don't look at alcohol in the same capacity as we did a century or two centuries ago. Um, so two centuries ago, you would have been looking as al at alcohol as a source of carbohydrates, a food source, and also food preservation, uh, where now it's more of a social lubricant, especially in this day and age of the craft beer renaissance and craft distillation. A lot of what you read and what you see on movies is kind of the romanticized version of Prohibition. Prohibition, yeah, there was a lot of excitement. Uh, if you read the newspapers of the time, it's filled with stories of rum runners and revenuers chasing each other. Uh, you have car crashes, you have loads being spilt on the roads, but on the other hand, there's also the other side. Many people died uh, because of prohibition. DLC was created after the repeal of prohibition. Uh, after the repeal of prohibition, uh, states were allowed to essentially determine what type of business model they were interested in having within their markets to uh, control access to and to promote responsible consumption of beverage alcohol in general, but in particular distilled spirits. The first actual um, operational still uh, was Jabez Rogers in Middlebury in uh, 1791. And uh, he was able to get his operation up and running. He was a uh, transplant from Connecticut. And uh, what was unique in his case was that he did get his facility going where he was making a uh, porter that was quite renowned and was also in distillation, uh, producing a gin, and also uh, at that time, whiskey was a um, generous term. It could have been potato, it could have been rye, corn, uh, barley, and blends of in-between. Really, at this time, distillation in Vermont just exploded. And take into, take into account the modern uh, craft beer explosion, where now we have 60 to 70 breweries. We go from almost no distilleries uh, in 1790 to about 200 distilleries plus by 1820. And uh, specifically in the, the 18 aughts, uh, really it starts to just, every town starts having a distillery and you know, it happens to also coincide with the, the emergence in Southern New England with um, prohibition, um, specifically with the temperance movement. And in Vermont by 1809, we have, um, I use the case of Peachum um, a lot where uh, Peachum had um, over 20 distilleries in the town. And there was a, a passage I had found in this, uh, it was an old newspaper, um, I think it was the, the uh, Northern Star, and it said, Fire on Sunday evening, the gin distillery of Ephraim Foster of Peachum, with its valuable contents, was destroyed by fire. It may not be improper to observe that 27 stills remain in operation in the single town of Peachum. If not with milk and honey, certainly this land overflows with gin and whiskey. And uh, at that point, interestingly enough, breweries were not as widespread in Vermont as distilleries. Um, there was only a handful of breweries documented. There was a lot more um, what I call cider brandy producers that were producing hard cider as well as um, brandy. Um, hard cider was produced by almost every family. At this time, you find records of families putting away 20, 30, 40 casks of cider in the basement for the winter as a, a form of survival. And in terms of the distillation, you see a lot of uh, apple brandy produced, which was basically a way of concentrating um, the cider, if you will. And you have a lot of whiskey producers as well as gin. And this continues up to the 1830s, but the 1820s is right where you start to see distillation hit its peak in Vermont with a lot of towns forming temperance groups in the 1820s. And in Vermont, alcohol and temperance are so interwoven, it's, it, there's not enough time to go over how much of an importance to the state history it is. And in the 1820s, 
you have a lot of towns starting to form their temperance groups mainly because there's widespread accounts and papers about public intoxication, um, labor work on farms not being done or farms struggling to find labor, and basically an overall degradation of uh, the family unit as, as they considered it, where uh, men were coming home intoxicated and uh, basically not assisting in the homestead and uh, also with the raising of the children. And Montpelier decides to um, conduct, as it's known now, the noble experiment, which is uh, prohibition. But Vermont um, takes a very interesting twist to it where it kicks it to the counties uh, to vote in 1848 on whether to go wet or dry. And from 1848 through 1851, uh, the, the counties uh, actually got to vote, and in the case of Essex County, it never actually went dry. Prohibition comes on the books, and prohibition basically states that you cannot produce for sale alcoholic beverages in the state. Um, you, there's a gray area that you could consume them, but you can't be held, uh, you can't be found to have in your possession bottles of. Um, among other uh, language used was panther's breath. Uh, for some of the slang. Um, moonshine was, uh, Mountain Dew was my personal favorite of the time period. And the alcohol, the distillation was outlawed entirely. Prohibition in Vermont from 1853 on was, uh, it was a damp state um, that uh, Scott Wheeler actually uh, quoted in, uh, in his work. Prohibition stays on the books um, up till 1902 and distillation in Vermont is just non-existent at this point. Um, if people had stills, it was the true uh, romanticized backwoods um, home still setups that people are producing, but there's no, there's no above ground distillation occurring. In most cases, um, towns were dry all the way through um, federal uh, prohibition and federal repeal into um, 1932. And um, once federal repeal occurs in Vermont, um, we actually have this uh, um, early Ponzi scheme, if you will, uh, that involved the Green Mountain Distillery. It was in Burlington, Vermont, and um, thankfully the records um, that were scarce, but there's still few, are housed at the Vermont Historical Society. And they basically want to launch a new spirit that utilizes maple um, to produce in the, in the same way that rum is produced. And they create a performa um, prospectus sheet for investors, um, st start selling uh, bo uh, stock bonds uh, for the company, um, which are, are there are uh, copies of it at the Historical Society. And they start to pull in money to open this. And they even have blueprints um, for the distillery to open this uh, large distillery and it was dubious uh, from the start because you know when you're competing against um, cane sugar um, from the Caribbean um, it's a very inexpensive uh, material compared to the labor involved in producing maple sugar and maple syrup um, and essentially once the money starts flowing into this Green Mountain distillery uh, the owners skip town and that was the last um, blip of dis distillation history till we get to the present, um, and by the present, the 1980s. We came from Scotland 201 years ago and settled in the New World. My uncles, after that, started making whiskey in Scotland, J and W Hardy. And when we came to this country, we've always been involved with agriculture and farming. I started keeping bees with my younger brother Tommy when he was nine and I was 12. Most of my life has been farming with honeybees. We peaked out at 1900 beehives in the Champlain Valley of Vermont and St. Lawrence River Valley of New York State. And as the bees declined, we continued to be involved with commercial beekeeping, but with less bees and with a greater amount of making value-added products. Wild cherry cough syrup, elderberry honey syrup, propolis spray, 
And that grew into making wine with honey mead and eventually spirits, adding raw honey to gin to make Bar Hill gin and making vodka from scratch from raw honey. And four years ago, I turned that over to the team to farm grain for them. On Thornhill Farm, we have grown winter rye and barley, all of it certified organic. And for the last three years, we have made Thornhill Farm rye whiskey with Caledonia Spirits. So we are now growing grain for them. And it feels like I've returned to the work of my ancestors by growing grain and making whiskey. Fit was just really good, um, and I, I just knew that Todd would be a great guy to work for. Um, so I, I jumped on board with Todd. I, I, I threw my, uh, my brewery business plan in the, uh, in the recycling bin, I think, and, um, and I just dove in. I had a lot to learn about distillation, but Todd was really supportive. He, he sent me to Kentucky, and I started you know, cultivating relationships with all the distillers I could find, which there are not that many. Um, but anybody that was willing to, to answer my questions, I'd, I'd stay as close to them as I could. I'd often send them a, a box of, you know, Vermont's finest beer and cheese as a thank you after they gave me some great advice. And um, um, we just started building a distillery. Um, it was great. It wasn't long before, you know, the distillery started to work. And I said, Todd, I think we need to get rid of the winery. Let's close down the winery and really just focus on spirits. And Todd was really receptive to that. Um, Fast forwarding, in about 2015, Todd decided that he really wanted to be closer to the farm. Todd is, a, is you know, it's part of his DNA. He is just a farmer. He loves to be close to the soil. He loves picking rocks and, and you know, just, just really, you know, growing and cultivating. Um, and that's where he wanted to be. I was in a situation where we hadn't even taken whiskey to market. We're, we're filling up barrels. You know, we, we've, we're not that long in market with our aged gin. We're really just kind of coming into a lot of the more fun things that I've been waiting for as a distiller. Um, I was really just getting the wheels under me. And um, I, I mentioned to Todd that um, if, if he were looking for an exit, I'd like to be the buyer of the company. And, um, and Todd was very supportive of that. And we, we worked out a, a deal where um, I was able to buy the company from Todd. Todd um, then went back to the farm. He's now started a 100-acre certified organic rye farm, and, um, and he's now our, our rye farmer. So um, we're, we're, we're buying certified organic rye from Todd, and we're making, uh, we're making a product called Thornhill Whiskey from it. We had a little research still when we were making honey wine, and we tried adding raw honey to gin and found it most enjoyable. We never stop R&D, developing new products. How can we grow things and turn them into something wonderful? And we soon saw that honey wine wasn't gonna work in the marketplace. People really want grape wine, as wonderful as honey wine is, and that our Bar Hill gin was gonna be pleasing and enjoyed by many. So we organically grew that very slowly over the years to where it is now. And the people vote with their purchases and they have supported that. Bar Hill Gin is, is, has definitely become our flagship. Um, we never really intended to be so focused on the gin business, um, nor did we realize that um, you know, gin was just gonna go through such a, such a moment. Um, you know, to be honest, I was a, a beer brewer, more of a, a beer geek, and, and Todd was really truly a farmer. So um, we weren't so connected to, to the cocktail scene um, as much as we are now. Um, so we had a lot to learn, but you know, just like any other craft spirits company, taking clear spirits, unaged spirits to market is, is your quickest route to being able to pay payroll. So vodka, gin, you know, those, those sort of things made sense as a starting point. The city was really excited to have us move here. Um, centrally located, um, you know, close for customers to come by, ability to find, you know, our staff and, and our team as this, you know, mission kind of continues to evolve. We, we need more people. Um, so Montpelier just made a lot of sense for us. Essentially, gin is flavored vodka, right? It's the original flavored vodka. You know, people think of flavored vodka as if it's like some awful ingredients like strawberry cheesecake vodka or something terrible like that. But in all reality, what gin is, is flavored vodka using botanicals. So you're starting with 190 proof spirit, um, 
which you know is, is basically the same thing as vodka, it truly is. And then we're distilling it through a, a um, botanical extraction still, which has suspended botanicals inside of the still. So it's a process of extracting that juniper flavor, or whatever botanicals you choose to put in the still. We only use juniper. Um, we extract that juniper in the distillate, the distillation process, and then the, the bulk gin that comes out, we then um, use raw honey to sweeten that, but um, we're doing more than sweetening, and that's kind of the beauty of raw honey, is there's this incredible floral botanical contribution. Um, so when you sort of look at the, the characteristics of, of our gin, it really doesn't taste like a one-dimensional gin that's only um, distilled from juniper. It's that raw honey that brings that complexity to it. Distilling is really important for Vermont. You know, set aside sort of the, the competitive side of distilling, but more about the, the impact of distilling on a community. You know, we, the amount of farmers we're employing right now is more than we ever thought we'd be able to do. The amount of employees that we have is, is, is really, you know, quite fun. Um, you know, I just think that distillation is an opportunity for, for a community. I mean, we've already seen it here, you know, just in, um, you know, the, the, the busyness of our, our bar here on site. You know, we have a no-tip policy where we pay our bartenders a livable wage. You know, they're not paid minimum wage, and then depending on tips to survive, they just have a, a wage, and it's a fair wage. Um, we, we still receive tips. We collect all those tips, and we've been donating the tips to um, local nonprofits in the area. Um, just for example, we raised $9,200 in July for the food shelf in Montpelier. You know, we raised over $10,000 in September for the uh, Vermont River Conservancy. Distillation has a much bigger opportunity to impact the agricultural landscape of Vermont. Um, and we've already seen it just with Todd, the amount of rye that we're buying from Todd, that's a brand new farm, this is a brand new product. Hasn't even gotten to market, but you know, we're, 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 we're supporting Todd and employing people on, on his farm. Internally, we talk about Caledonia Spirits, out in the market, we're Bar Hill. Um, so there, there's definitely some branding challenges there, but um, Caledonia Spirits is, is the company. Um, we make other products, you know, we, we, we have a, an experimental brand. We call it um, Experiments of Agricultural Rectification. It's a, and it's, it's an intentional mouthful, but the, the goal is to um, work with local area farmers to run any experiment, you know, no experiment's too small and no farmer's ideas are too crazy and it's all worthwhile. So we've, we've um, again, this is all not under the Bar Hill family of brands. This is a, a Caledonia Spirits, you know, um, experiment. Um, but we recently did a great project with the Kate Farm in Plainfield where um, we fermented and distilled burdock root. And we've come up with this incredible spirit that um, the, the only, without tasting it, it's, it's hard to describe, but the only thing that we can really, um, you know, liken it to is like a tequila or a mezcal, but from the Northeast. And that was a really refreshing project because we just didn't know that those flavors existed up here. We just had no idea. And when Richard and Sally, you know, the burdock farmers called us, we thought this is an absolutely terrible idea. How could this possibly taste good? Um, but once we distilled it, we were in love with it. And uh, we actually just, just released it. And, um, and it was you know, a huge success. It, it, it's, um, it's selling very, very quickly. Um, we'll be sold out very soon. And um, it's, it's just a flavor that we just didn't know, you know lived under the soil of the Northeast. So suddenly prohibition came and we had strangers arriving and they were here to go to Canada to drink or to drink or to buy alcohol. Okay, you got to remember the, the, uh, the border wasn't the way it is today. Uh, there were unguarded border crossings where people could just drive across and even the guard the guarded borders some of them some of them were uh, it was an honor system you had to drive in the town to check in so uh, the the outsiders there, there were plenty of outsiders who came here to go to Canada to buy alcohol but there was also your local folks you know contrary to popular belief most people especially the locals did not get rich running booze bootlegging or whatever you want to call it uh, most of them were just small time operators um, they they did it to help them through the depression 
uh, or they did it just for fun. Others did it simply because the government told them not to. Many of them did not get rich. Uh, some, some made a good living, but a lot of people actually went broke. Because back in those days, if the uh, person who went to jail for, for running the booze happened to be the breadwinner of the family, uh, often at times the family lost everything. Very few bodies of water that actually crosses the border. The Lake Memphis Magog here uh, was a major, uh, it was a major traffic route uh, for smugglers. Actually, this, this lake has served as a traffic route since Native American uh, times. The Abenaki use it as a transportation route between their settlements in Quebec and our, the settlements in this region. And then the logging industry did the same thing. The logs would come down the lake uh, to the, from the logging grounds in Canada uh, to the mills in Newport, including the mill that stood right at, here at the east side, the International Mill, which was a large hardwood mill. Then come Prohibition, so smugglers came down the, came down the lake in boats in the uh, non-winter season. Come winter though, they would uh, they'd come down the uh, lake either sleds, as in pulled by horses, or they would come uh, by vehicles. Here's where the locals also came to play. Uh, while, while the locals were relatively small time players, work uh, compared to the, the folks from like Boston, Hartford, those were larger people typically. Well, the, the, uh, they often utilized the expertise of the locals who really knew the road. Um, and considering how little they were paid during, particularly during the depression to work, they were paid very, very well to, uh, to go to Canada and run a uh, load across the border. And one fella told me, he said, it was almost impossible for him to pass it up. He was making $125 a run. Now you figure it out, if you uh, figure out what that was back in, uh, back in the 1920s and early 30s, that was a good chunk of change. Most of the really fast cars that the law men used, either federal, state, or local were actually the confiscated cars, the souped up ones that were built for speed. Those became the police cars of the time. I do have some great photos of the lawmen on Lake Champlain and some of their boats were confiscated. Some or all were confiscated uh, uh, rum runners. From what I can see by newspaper clippings of the time, um, uh, it was largely beer. Uh, you did get some loads of liquor, but it was largely beer, and one kind of beer uh, seems to have been, I believe it was Molson, from what I just go through the old newspaper clippings uh, of the time. But it was, it was largely beer, and I think if you're going to be smuggling liquor, I think it took a little extra money. Some people resorted to smuggling and resorted to making booze almost simply because they were told not to. Because if you tell people, if the government tells you not to do something, there's a group of people who do it just to despite the government. This farm was settled in the early 1800s. Um, it was a basically a subsistence farm for um, most of its history uh, and then it was became a small dairy farm um, in the early 1900s and then by 1955 it was um, the farm was was closed and it just became um, a residence uh, in I bought the property in 2004 uh, and started uh, clearing land and have been farming here since 2010 so my goal has always been to run a small-scale, diversified farm, the kind of farm that really have um, disappeared in Vermont or becoming quite rare in, in the Northeast. And 
one that's not a farm that's not specialized really in any one particular thing but uses its its land base um, to support a bunch of different uh, operations that all reinforce one another um, and so I believe that diversity is strength and so that's what I, I started as a livestock farm um, raising pigs uh, and chickens and cows um, and uh, then got into growing grain as I was able to open up more land. I've always done fruit here. Um, we have a lot of uh, old apple trees on the property that I've fixed up and I've put in some new orchards. Um, and that just sort of, it sort of grew from there and growing grain, growing oats, growing corn to feed the livestock. Um, combined with the history of this region, um, this was a hotbed of distilling activity in the early 1800s. There were a dozen different distilleries just in Cabot. And I believe there were about 20 in Peachum. We're right on the Cabot Peachum town line. Um, so this was a big hotbed of distilling. And I was doing all the things that people were doing in the early 1800s. And so um, it made sense then. And I thought that now where it's so difficult to have a diversified farm um, with the economic conditions, you need to have uh, some value-added product, something that's unique that you're making that people can be excited about that sets you apart from trying to do commodity sales and so it just distilling seemed a natural fit. I do a, a spruce gin with spruce tips that I pick fresh for the distillation um, and then uh, hops that we grow and some spearmint and lemon balm. <laughs> I always use the same tree. So a lot of people pick spruce tips only in the springtime and I've found that it really makes, for, at least for making a, a gin, it really makes no difference what time of the year you pick the spruce tips. Um, and so we'll pick them fresh all year round. We'll pick the tips off of three or four limbs. Um, you know, the batch that I'm going to run today will make about 12 cases of gin. Um, so that's 144 bottles. And so it's, it's actually not that, not a tremendous amount of, of botanicals. So that's it. So not, not that many. Uh, and we'll go, uh, we'll go pick the lemon balm and the oregano. A little bit of... This is lovage. It's a relative of celery. I use this very sparingly because it's very potent. And this time of year, the sprigs are very small, there's not much growth on them. They're one of the first plants that come up in the springtime. And this is uh, my spearmint patch. Mm -hmm. This is a variety that I transplanted from southern New Hampshire. Um, and it's, it's fairly potent. I don't do any you know, care or maintenance down here, so it's basically a little wild growing patch. Most gins are, are made from uh, a neutral spirit, a, what's called a grain neutral spirit. Um, I use a white rum um, because it adds a little bit more flavor to the, an, a tiny bit of back sweetness to the gin um, while, still kind of, while still keeping it a dry gin. So uh, what I'm doing is using a hydrometer to measure the proof of the rum that we're gonna distill out for the gin. This is about 30%. 30% alcohol or 60 proof. dried these. These are lovely 
はあ、そのみたいなあっそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうこれはこれであの全然。Um, those will condense because they have a, a much higher boiling point than, than the range that alcohol is in. Those will condense and they'll fall back in the pot. So, this, the alcohol that's in here started out clear. What's left after we're done distilling will be a dark brown color.、Uh, and then, anything that's volatile in the range that alcohol is, in that 180, 190 degrees, that's going to come over out the gin basket. And then get condensed in the condenser and drip out the end of the condenser. And it runs once it's up to temperature and running. I'll get about a gallon and a half of distillate an hour. And so this will be about a 10 hour run、um, to make our gin. Where do I see us going? I see us continuing our mission of.、Um, You know, working, we now have 100 acres of land here in Cabot, and、uh, as long as that, that farm is growing and is financially sustainable、um, and is healthy and our family's healthy, that's, that's the goal for us. So it's not to grow into some enormous corporation, it's to continue the, the steady path that we're on、um, of in, increasing. Sales and revenue and products as, as time and energy allows.、Uh, when prohibition was repealed,、uh, state rights came into play, and a number of states chose to have direct governmental control over the distribution and retailing of、uh, beverage alcohol in general, but spirits in particular.、Uh, the 16 control states all have a Unique approach to managing their business. In some cases, they function as wholesalers. In other cases, they function as wholesalers and distributors. And in other cases, such as the state of Vermont and the adjoining states of Maine and New Hampshire,、uh, the state is involved in distribution,、uh, retailing, and、uh, providing. Laws, rules, and regulations、uh, to mitigate some of the negative aspects of consumption of beverage alcohol.、Uh, historically,、uh, distilled spirits w a s treated as a more serious or more、uh, heavily regulated type of beverage alcohol due to the fact that it is,、um, in comparison, higher in levels of、uh, ethyl alcohol. Uh, so that's why we have different levels of taxation for spirits, for wine, and for beer. I think it would be correct to say that the department operates a retail model、uh, with presently、uh, 75 retailers throughout the state.、Uh, the state actually functions in this case as the wholesaler. So we、uh, purchase product on wholesale from、uh, a global assortment of manufacturers, importers, and suppliers.、Uh, we distribute those products、uh, throughout the state. Uh, we warehouse those products and、uh, we provide、uh, deliveries to our、uh, 75 retailers on a regular basis.、Uh, we control pricing for the products, we control listings、uh, in terms of what is、uh, chosen to be sold in the state to address、uh, innovation and、uh, trends in the industry that resonate with consumers. 
Uh, so basically it's our uh, retailers uh, that interface directly with the general public and the department provides a network of support using uh, supplier discounts to uh, provide uh, pricing that is uh, resonating with consumers and uh, putting us in a competitive position to uh, deal with our neighbors in New Hampshire that have a business model that has no excise tax or sales tax. Uh, so we do have some challenges in terms of um, attracting local business, uh, maintaining local business, earning local business, and uh, providing uh, Vermont citizens with compelling reasons to support our, uh, our business model. Uh, there's actually uh, 24 uh, craft distillers that are presently manufacturing product within the state. I think that uh, clearly uh, Vermont has had a, a tremendous level of success in branding itself as a uh, brewing center for the uh, Northeast, but nationally as well. Uh, I believe that the uh, administration uh, views an opportunity to develop a uh, craft distilling industry uh, that can emulate uh, some of the success of our uh, brewing industry and to uh, create a um, local industry uh, that provides jobs, uh, provides taxing resources to the state and also helps to uh, provide opportunities for visitors to our state to come and experience uh, distilled spirits manufacturing Clearly it's a growing trend throughout the United States. I think that uh, Vermont has done a nice job in developing its local industry, but the industry itself could not survive without the support of the Department of Liquor Control. Uh, it started by uh, my friends contacted me on a drive back from a distillery class in Rochester, New York. Uh, they asked me if I could figure out how to make a barrel. And uh, those gentlemen uh, started 14 Star Brewing. So I uh, figured it out, asked Tony if he wanted to be a part of it. He said yes, and uh, here we are. So we, we spent the next six months uh, reverse engineering a used barrel and, and uh, perfecting it until we were able to make it watertight. And we've been kind of perfecting it and doing it ever since. Uh, we're, we're all self-taught. Um, myself, I uh, have done a little bit of woodworking and, and house remodeling. Uh, one of the partners, Mac, he had made some custom furniture um, kind of as a, as a side project. So we were always interested in uh, woodworking and, and making things with our hands. So uh, it just kind of made sense that we, we uh, figured it out. And, um, and uh, through trial and error, we were able to, to make barrels. So the first part is um, we source our wood. Um, all the wood that we've used so far is from Vermont. Uh, we, we also have some wood seasoning right now from other parts of New England. Uh, once the wood seasons for about 12, 12 months or so, uh, we're, per, we're currently using 24 month um, aged wood. Um, we then form that wood into staves. Um, and then once we form them into staves, we arrange them in, in a circular fashion and bend it over a slow, slow oak fire. It takes about an hour. And once we finish bending it, we will uh, char it or toast it to the customer specifications. Um, cut out a groove around the inside for the head to sit. We'll uh, make the heads and, and put the heads in. Right now, the way that we're doing it right now, it takes about one day to make one barrel from start to finish. Um, we don't necessarily make one barrel per day. We, we uh, spend a day making a bunch of staves and then we'll spend the next day maybe um, ranging them into a, into a, uh, a hoop and um, so it averages about out to about one a day. Uh, we use uh, white oak, American white oak. There is a, there is a small amount of uh, white oak available in Vermont. It's um, not very plentiful, um, which is the main reason why we've looked throughout other parts of New England. Um, there's not, a, there's not a lot of differences between the, the wood in Vermont, Maine, um, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Um, it's all, we consider it Northeast White Oak and it's all local to this region. The first barrel that we made, we, we took a barrel apart that was a used barrel and we looked at the shape and we figured out how to make that shape. Um, we put it all together, we, we tightened it up and we thought what we, we made what we thought looked like a, a usable barrel 
and when we filled it up with water, it, it wasn't even close. It was leaking everywhere. So uh, we had to adjust our angles, adjust some of the processes we were using, and um, refine some of our techniques, and, and it took about six months for us to, to get that finished product. We, that we source from New England is very unique in, in the, in the uh, white oak spectrum because it has a very slow growth season because of the, the uh, harsh winters in Vermont and New England, and so the grains are very tight. Um, there's also a lower tannin level and a higher level of trans whiskey and cis whiskey lactones, which uh, affect the aroma. So it's a very unique profile in our barrels, and uh, I think one of the things that makes a barrel great is its uniqueness compared to other barrels. Um, our plans are to partner with two to three distilleries and um, scale our production as they scale their production, so we'll grow with them. Um, we have um, a small amount of customers that, that have a, a um, predictable amount of barrels that they need per month, and we program that into our production schedule. Um, as they ramp up their production, we, we slowly ramp up our production, and um, eventually when we're when we're doing this full time, we'll be able to scale that even more and maybe take on more customers. That's the greatest thing about working with our brothers at Green Mountain Grain and Barrel. Uh, they're literally shoulder to shoulder with us on a daily basis. We have the ability to give them feedback on their barrels. Um, some of the early barrels were leaking a little bit and we were able to refine their process to tighten that up. Um, now we haven't seen that since then. Um, getting those barrels a little bit more charred uh, to work on the color is definitely uh, a process in itself. Uh, so yeah, having that collaboration, having them come in and distill with us gives them a, a front view of how the process works so that they can refine their trade as well. Husband and I bought this property about 15 years ago. Um, it is a um, beautiful old antique farm. Um, that has a lot of history, but uh, it's a very warm and welcoming place, and we fell in love with it. There was some of the uh, old land that had been part of the farm that we bought just to preserve the open space, and with all the fields and the orchards, we were trying to decide what to do. Um, more at one point, I thought about you know planting some grapes and starting a vineyard. One of our friends uh, at the Pitcher Inn said, you know. The grapes that grow in Vermont, it's a tough climate. You're better off making something indigenous like whiskey or apple brandy. Um, and it was sort of a serendipity moment for us. I love um, French apple brandy. And we decided to, to start a distillery around that, uh, not knowing much about the business or the industry uh, other than as consumers. It was kind of by chance that I got into distilling. I was hired uh, to renovate the barn here and to kind of build the distillery back in 2011. Um, and through that process of uh, renovation, became interested in distilling and decided to stay on and uh, run the place. When we started the distillery, uh, we didn't, uh, we made a conscious decision not to make vodka, not to make gin, a lot of the things that people make to get out quickly and get cash flow. Uh, we really wanted to make um, aged spirits, you know, whiskeys, brandies, and rum uh, that imparted some of the terroir of the local um, environment. So I think water is very distinctive here, you know, in, in Kentucky, a lot of the bourbons are renowned because of the limestone water source. You know, here I think we've got very pure water. Um, likewise, we, you know, we age our uh, maple cask rum and use maple syrup uh, bourbon barrels. Um, so we try to use as much kind of local ingredients or local flavor just to give people a sense of where it came from. So our very first product was actually rum and the reason we did that was more just kind of logistical. Um, when you're making whiskeys from grain, you have to mash the grain, you know, convert the starch into sugar and then ferment it. So it's a more extended process when, when we were setting up the still which came from Germany, um, we decided to make some rum. So to be considered rum, you have to distill it from a cane-based product. So whether that's molasses, evaporated cane juice, or just sugar itself, uh, we chose from the beginning to use Demerara sugar. Um, we, we've experimented molasses a little bit, but we found that sugar is just easier to work with and it makes a cleaner tasting rum. Um, and so we mix that Demerara sugar with warm water uh, and then add our yeast and it ferments for about a week to two weeks uh, and then it's distilled through our pot still. We made this just to test out the still, but we found that the rum was really delicious. So we decided that in addition to the whiskeys and the brandies, that was our initial focus, we would start making rum. 
Our rum, our aged rums, drink a lot like uh, a whiskey does, and that is um, in part due to how we barrel age it, um, and uh, it makes for a unique sipping rum. So, well, we have four different rums um, that we sell, and um, each one of the rums have a completely different personality. So the vanilla rum is meant for a cocktail rum. It is um, clean, it's bright, it's 100% demo. All of our rums are 100% Demomera sugar base. And then we have our aged rum, which is our first run rum and the first product that we actually um, uh, developed. And that first run rum is the base for our other two rums. Our maple cask rum is twice aged. The second time it's aged in a barrel that's aged maple syrup. So it is just fabulous in an old fashioned. It's great with a cinnamon simple syrup. It's great with walnut bitters. It's delicious with hot cider, uh, you know. And then our final rum is uh, a Pedro Jimenez aged rum. And it, that is really probably the geekiest thing that we make. Um, it is a rum that's finished in Pedro Jimenez sherry barrels. Um. Well, you know, I think any startup is hard, right? You face a lot of challenges, uh, just in terms of growth, cash flow, things like that. Uh, I will say that I think that the environment in Vermont, particularly the regulators and the lawmakers, are very supportive. You know, I think we benefited greatly from the fact that the um, uh, craft brewing industry has done so well here in Vermont. You know, in terms of tourism, jobs, just name recognition for quality Vermont products outside of Vermont. And so I think as a result of that, they've been, you know, frankly, more embracing for the craft distilling industry than a lot of other states have been. And so I think it's a great environment in that regard. We opened this place because we needed um, a public face of our company that wasn't in um, a, a very rural town. So Warren, where the distillery is located, is a beautiful spot. Uh, we have two booming ski resorts in the area but it's very seasonal and tourist driven. Uh, Burlington, on the other hand, is home to, I think, five colleges. Uh, there's a um, kind of burgeoning tech industry. There's a lot of young professionals. It's the most populated city in Vermont. So it seemed like a natural fit for us to come and get more exposure in the state. Um, also, we're one of the few distilleries that makes our product from scratch. So it's a great way to kind of bridge the gap between, I call it, you know, this is our our city tasting room, and then we have the country distillery. Unlike beer and wine, uh, spirits are something that when you have them in your house, they're not really a single serving item. You know, you might buy a bottle of whiskey and have that in your house for two years, who knows? Um, so I think it's very important to educate consumers about what to do with those spirits because there aren't that many, in the grand scheme of things, there aren't that many straight spirits drinkers. So the number one thing people ask us is what do I do with this at home or how do I go back to where I'm visiting from and share this with my family and, and show it in the best light. And for us that really means cocktails because Again, unless somebody is a dedicated whiskey drinker or they, they drink um, sipping rum or whiskey with cigars, th there's a whole other world of cocktails that's more approachable to more spirits drinkers. So I think the, the future is really to continue to grow um, organically. Uh, we're focused really on the, the Northeast. We're in you know, all of New England, New York now. We're starting to get into some other jurisdictions, but we really want to be um, established here before we start spreading our wings elsewhere. Make a right old fashioned, so it's a classic cocktail, three ingredients. We don't want to steer too far away from the notes that our base spirit has. So um, we're going to start with a couple dashes of orange bitters, a couple dashes of Angostura, which is like allspice, nutmeg, cinnamon. A couple bar spoons of simple. That's just going to cut the heat a little bit. And then two ounces of rye whiskey. Right. And then we're just going to stir this for about 30 seconds.
This is your classic three ingredient, old fashioned, bitter, sugar, base spirit. So I'm gonna make a classic Bee's Knees cocktail for you. Um, it's kind of our flagship cocktail, but it was actually invented around 1920s. Uh, it's very simple, very fresh, very balanced. So we'll be doing two full ounces of gin. Three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. And we always do fresh squeezed lemon juice. And three quarters of an ounce of honey syrup. So the honey syrup is two parts raw honey and one part water. So have fun experimenting with different kind of local raw honeys. And we'll shake that up. When you're shaking a drink, you want to shake hard. We're trying to wake up the drink, not rock it to sleep. And drop it right in there. Here you go. Classic Bees Knees cocktail. Cheers.